All right, good morning, maybe good afternoon for some people online. So today it's uh, it's Friday, so a lot of people work from home, but I'm glad that you came to the, to the office and uh, to be here at this webinar uh, this morning. Uh, we've got more than 200, uh, 200 people who signed up uh, online, so they'll be watching this uh, event on, the, on Teams. Uh, so today's uh, webinar is the last of three webinars that we've had this week, uh, addressing the, the four pillars of our uh, human excellence uh, week. Uh, the first one was by Andre Kuipers, uh, addressing uh, performance and uh, development, also internal mobility. I think it's always interesting, uh, Andre Kuipers and internal mobility. I am really have this, this view of him floating in the, in the International Space Station, part of his uh, mobility uh, initiative. But uh, I think our internal mobility is a little bit more than the than the floating in the in the space station. Uh, then we had uh, yesterday we had Thijs, uh, Thijs Launsbach uh, addressing uh, vitality and uh, we saved the best for last. Uh, Jos Dierks uh, today will be addressing uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, at the end of the hour, one hour presentation, uh, there will be ample of opportunity for a QA. and a a Q&A here in the auditorium. There's a microphone. Online, you can submit a uh, question in the in the chat room and then uh, using our uh, technology, the question will end up on my iPhone and uh, I can read up the question and then of course address the question to uh, to Jos. So diversity and inclusion is an important, a very important theme. Um, I think out of the four uh, human excellence themes, I mean this uh, to me is uh, one of the most important ones. Uh, Boscalis as an uh, international company uh, with uh, strong Dutch roots. Um, we have more than 10,000 uh, professionals working in the company um, from more than 60 countries, uh, 60 nationalities uh, operating in uh, more than 75 countries. Uh, so we are we are very diverse in the building that I work in uh, building three. We have around 400 people and more than 40 nationalities. In the in the building, um, and also once a week I call uh, one of our vessels, and yesterday I called uh, one of our he heavy transport uh, vessels, and uh, I was talking to the captain, and, uh, and I asked him about the crew, and also there we have a very diverse crew uh, with people from Russia, Ukraine, Latvia, all working together uh, extremely well, which was very nice to hear with all the of course the. The challenges, the problems we have in the world that on our vessels, we have people from Ukraine and Russia working very well together. Um, so what does I mean diversity and inclusion means to me? Uh, I'm a strong believer that uh, diverse teams are better performing teams as long as there is, uh, of course, psychological safety. So people from different cultures, different nationalities really feel that they can uh, that they can participate. I think diverse teams uh, will uh, result in, in better decisions uh, being uh, being taken. Um, and of course, the more diversity you have, uh, the more a need for inclusion. Uh, make sure that everybody's included. Uh, there, I think the KPI, which often I mean, stands for Key Performance Indicator, I really think you need to remember that KPI also can stand for Key People Interested, Key People Informed, Key People Involved, Key People Included. Um, so. That is uh, that was my introduction. Now I'm going to introduce the, the speaker. And I've got the introduction here because it's a very long one. It will take around 30 minutes. <laughs> so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jos Dierks. Uh, she's originally from the Netherlands. Uh, she was born in Brazil and has lived in 13 countries. Her international upbringing shaped her in many ways and led her to become a two time founder, bestseller author, global DNI expert and CEO of emotional intelligence startup. Jos will talk to us about cultural perceptions, unconscious bias and a deeper understanding of DNI. I've seen some of her uh, material online. She's a very insp inspirational uh, speaker. So let's get inspired. Jos Dirks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, good morning, good afternoon. Um, 13, thank you so much for the lovely intro, by the way. I really appreciate that. 
13 is outdated though, it's 15. Um, and I'm 35, so for the mathematicians in the room, I don't know, it's like 2.6 something um, years per country, per continent. And now in the Netherlands, in a city, you might have heard of it. It's very far away from here, but it's Maastricht. Um, so yeah, that's where I'm based and it's absolutely beautiful. I'm having a great time becoming reacquainted with Dutch culture, which is quite a beast. Um, how many of you associate yourselves as Dutch, as Gewoon Lekker Nederlands? All right, okay, great. Um, assumably, by way of hands, those of you that don't. All right, a handful of you sprinkled throughout the room as well. Lovely, thank you. I'm going to raise my hand in that group. Um, I am originally from the Netherlands, which explains uh, my name, which I'll talk about a little bit more just now. Um, but yeah, the, the growing up across different countries definitely makes you think about what we just heard, the importance of diversity. And also the little sneaky ways that many of us don't actually feel included. And here's the kicker on this one. Everyone knows something racist that happens, right? Like you can sit at the dinner table and be like, man, you will not believe what happened, this crazy thing. Everybody knows a racist thing that happens or a sexist thing that happens. But no one knows the sexist. No one knows the rapist. How's all this stuff happening? Where is that? was not me. I'm not doing it. So those are some of the really interesting perceptions and conceptions that I want to talk to you about today. And I also want to say for the Dutch people in the room today and any Dutch people joining online, you know, D did you know that Dutch kids are the happiest kids in the world? OK, some of you are nodding your heads. Do you know why? This this is so, so awesome. It is literally two reasons. One, they get to ride their bicycles like freedom. And the second is Hagelslag. They get to start their day with chocolate sprinkles. So for any parents that are not in the Netherlands, give your kids chocolate. And I don't mean like sugar, I mean real chocolate in the morning. And it's a win. Anyway, speaking of kids, um, you see these two, these two kids right here. I don't know if any of you know this story, but it really is so beautiful. They got the same haircut. You see? You know why? They wanted to fool their teacher so that the teacher couldn't tell them apart. <laughs> That's why they got the same haircut. I love it. Because that really is what it is, right? That's love. It, it's, it's literally that simple. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. And I really encourage you, anything that I say or that triggers something in you, think, you know, write it down if you've got a piece of paper. But remember it because I love hearing your experiences of this very real thing that is affecting all of us all the time. And before I really get into it, you know, it's like literally the worst topic to have to speak on diversity and inclusion. I would rather talk about anything else because it's so deep. It's so deep on people. They're like, yeah, I've been faulted. I deserve more or yeah, like everybody's looking at me like I'm the bad guy. You know, I can't get this thing right. What should I, can I even make a joke anymore at work? So we all have this like deeply personal experience about diversity and inclusion. You know why that is? It's because we're literally all diverse. And we have an idea of who is not diverse. And that's shaped by thousands of years of history, the word alone, his story, history. So it makes sense, but let it be personal for you. Feel it, feel it today in your system. That's OK that you have a somatic experience to this. I do. I'm on stage um, and and it makes sense. Just like education, d &I is deeply personal. So I told you a little bit about my name. That's my name is Jos. Um, my parents were like super radical in the late 80s and decided to give me an ambiguous name. One time I was trying to board a flight for KLM and they were like, uh, Passagier Jos Dirks, Jos Dirks. So I got up and I walked to the front of the counter and um, they're like, no, no, Vizuka, we're looking for Jos Dirks. And I'm like, yeah, that's me. And they're like, no, no, this person's flying business class. 
And I was like, that that is me. Um, so funny name, mine. Um, but also, it is a city in Nigeria, which is great. Many of you might have traveled to Nigeria because of your work here at Boscalis. Um, city in Nigeria called Yos, and it was so funny because my parents made me stand next to all these signs, Yos University. Hospital of Yos, welcome to Yos. There's even a Facebook group. Yos is the best city in the world. I've obviously joined it. But regardless of this, you know, this is a name. Look how much a name does, right? So even what's in a name will give so much color to someone's experience on Earth. And it does really work well with my Nigerian colleagues and friends when I go do workshops and keynotes in Nigeria because I tell them that I was named after a city in their country and immediately I'm cool. Like immediately they like me. I'm part of the team. Whereas when I told you I live in Maastricht, maybe you were like, oh God, <laughs> that's quite a far trip. Is that Atve or Atval for Avir? I'm not really sure which one I took, but it's far, right? But it's not. It's quite close. The Netherlands is a small country. Anywho, as we talk about DNI today, I think one of the main things for us to keep into consideration, and it goes back to these two kids that I showed you at the beginning, is that the first problem for all of us is not to learn, but to unlearn. So any conceptions that we have, it's kind of like a computer program. Whatever you decide you're gonna think today or do today or be today, you literally can be, do, or think today. And that's such a, an empowering thought that whatever your experience is largely a program that you've been running for the last X amount of years of your life that has shaped you to be the Dutch, whatever English, American, Canadian, Nigerian person that you are today. It's just a series of lived experiences. You can stop them right now. So consider that unlearning is an incredibly important part of your DNI journey. And the cool thing about DNI, I did give you the bad side about talking about it, but the cool thing about DNI is that it never stops. It's not like I've now talked about one topic and it's going to go out of fashion. It's, it's literally going to be with us because the world is changing and we're working differently now very differently. So this is always going to be something that we have to be really good at. So for today's three main takeaways and like store these in your system, I'd like you to focus on three things. Unlearn, sort yourself out, and focus on lived experiences. Make that part of your DNI journey this morning. Unlearn, sort yourself out first because we're really good at blaming other people. Sort yourself out and lived experiences. And I'll talk about sort yourself out. I've already spoken a little bit about unlearning through Gloria Steinem, but I, yeah, I, I think the DNI, the term DNI expert in my bio is so funny. I really put it there to, to, you know, work with people and make them think that I'm good at what I do. But my mom was diagnosed with Parkinson's about four years ago, and she was at the time deputy ambassador in Ukraine, actually. She was deputy ambassador in Kiev. And she was diagnosed with Parkinson's, get this, on International Parkinson's Day. So I did, you know, I speak, I spoke with her and I was like, mom, like, you would pick this day. But like, it's not funny, you know, and it's, it's awful. But as I'm watching her progress through this disease, neurodegenerative disease, I'm realizing I have no idea about diversity and inclusion. I have no idea. Because what it means for her now, as a gender expert in countries like Dhaka, Bangladesh, South Sudan, now she's like, whoa, this is a whole new lived experience. Because her body's changing, right? So we don't know DNI. And that's awesome. Because that means we get to learn together. So when I put sort yourself out first, that was really for me. That was one of my biggest lessons. How am I gonna be a better daughter, supporter? understander of people who live in different bodies than they were used to having for X amount of years. And that's a very big reality for so many of us. And finally, lived experiences. This one is amazing. We're all in this room now together in this moment, and some of you are dialing in online. But the way we got here is super different. Some of us might have had a smoothie for breakfast. Others might have had screaming kids for breakfast. I don't know. But ultimately, we're all in, in this room already. Just this morning, there's like infinite possibilities on how it could have gone. And then a handful of possibilities ended up being what we are today. So think about that. You have no idea. 
that that's the basis of this current. I think I'm done because I have no one has any idea. So no, but we don't. So that's why this is so exciting. So I'm going to do a little experiment with you. Just think about this yourself. And if you have an idea, you're welcome to raise your hand. But you have uncooked spaghetti, a yard of string, a yard of masking tape and a marshmallow. OK, these are four ingredients you all have right now in your back pocket. You can do anything with these four ingredients. You can break string tape or stick them. You are working with your peers, so imagine like, you know, groups of four around the room and you're trying to build a really high tower competing against these folks. CEOs, lawyers and business school students. So those are your ingredients, uncooked spaghetti, yard of string, a yard of masking tape, a marshmallow. You can do whatever you want with these ingredients. You're working with a group of your peers. So people in this room and you have to build a high tower against CEOs, lawyers and business school students. And against these ones, these kiddos. Who do you want to compete against? Who do you think you're going to beat? Are you going to beat the CEOs? Yeah. Are you going to beat the lawyers? Like legit, right? So sorry. <laughs> and the business school students, are you going to beat them? No, I'm not so sure. OK, well, you're definitely not going to beat the kindergartners because literally they build the highest tower every single time that this experiment is run and not just a little bit. Actually, the business school students build about 10 inches. You know why? Because they're like, well, I think we need to do this and I'm going to pull up this flip chart and uh, this is my strategy and here's another quadrant. And literally no one cares. Um, lawyers also spend huge amounts of time talking about exactly what can or cannot be allowed in the building of this tower. The CEOs are OK, like they have life experience. You know, CEOs are pretty cool, um, but these kindergartners by far the coolest. By far 27 inch towers on average and fast too. You know, they are just building. They take their little ingredients and there's no ego. There's no hierarchy. There's no color. They all got the same haircut. No one cares and they build. That is awesome. That is creativity and that is innovation. So when we talk about the subject of DNI, it's not just because, you know, you have to be nice to a woman when she's standing in front of you or you, you know, hold the elevator door open. No, it's literally about your innovation power as a company moving forward in the 21st century. You will lose out too much if you don't have the ability to do this. So when we think about these kindergartners and we think about how they're able to really just do something together. You know, that for me is the essence of diversity. It's the essence of getting rid of a lot of that ego stuff of our expectation of how a certain moment is supposed to go. Realize we have no idea, seriously, no idea and make the most of it. So that's what diversity really means to me. And I really see that my kindergarten had like 13 kids of 13 nationalities. So it was in Dhaka, Bangladesh, actually, and I went to an international preschool. Um, so, you know, we, you, we don't know. But what about to you? Does anybody feel comfortable sharing what diversity means to you? Again, no one's an expert, um, but I will. I'll hold tight and you can tell me later, um, but diversity is interesting. So there's actually like kind of a, a clear way to think about it, which is kind of helpful. People do like structures and frameworks. So demographic and acquired demographic is essentially internal. Demographic diversity, it's related to a situation a person may be born into. They might not have chosen this for themselves and it could be hard to change. Um, that would be things like your age, your gender, race, ethnicity, nationality, sexual orientation, ability, disability. And I note, I say maybe hard to change. Um, we all know we can shave years off our life if we want to, but it's not um, it's not, you know, it's 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 internal, it's demographic. And then there's acquired, which refers to external. So things that related to someone, but are not necessarily things that they're born with and they can and do change. Acquired diversity is thinking style, it's personality, it's location, language, family status and communication style. So all of these things have a little bit more mobility in them and it kind of helps to have this framework 
because then when you start to think of diversity, you don't think about it as what they did in the 70s um, around Bretton Woods when we were just adding women. We're like, you know, people would look around a boardroom and they'd be like, well, is there a woman in here? Well, I can't seem to find one. Quick, we got to get one, right? So that's, we don't want that. This is not a checkbox exercise in that way. Actually, as a woman, when someone says to me, what does it feel like for you to be a female founder or a, a female CEO? I'm like, well, quite frankly, I mean, I don't know because I've never been a male CEO, but I can tell you that being a CEO is really tough and I'm exhausted. So essentially what I'm saying here is, you know, it's not a checkbox exercise and we do have power to think about this in multiple facets. And that's actually really cool. Our brains like to think like that. So I, I showed you these kindergartners earlier and I'm tying it to diversity in the sense that there's room for play and there's room to let ego at the door and there's room to celebrate each other's skills and talents and getting to that high tower. So those kindergartners are onto something. While the business school students are busy discussing, the kindergartners are doing some really cool stuff. And that's why I'm asking you to consider what you might need to unlearn. And some of that is things like trust. We don't trust people that don't look like us. Oh my God, yeah, I said it. We don't trust people that don't look like us. You know why? Because thousands upon thousands of years of biological training taught us we, we, we should be a little careful. We don't know what's there. We don't know what's out there. So yes, neurologically, you know, we're operating in this world that's asking us to have skills that our brain has never really had to form. That's why you have this morning today. Because no matter how much we talk about this topic, it's still a skill that we're constantly all sharpening. So we don't really know how to trust. And then add to that all the times that your one manager did something in 1995 and you still can't really get over it. And then like the checkout counter at the Albertine didn't work. So you were late. I mean, no one cares, but it's still affecting our, our, our ability to trust. Kindergartners, they don't have this. The second thing is action. We don't really like to take action. Does anybody know why? You don't need the mic. You can just, just one or two words. Why don't we like to take action? Exhausting, lazy, yeah, other, our brain does that as well. The least amount of energy we need to spend to keep ourselves alive, right? That's really what we are meant to be doing. But there's another reason we don't take action, and that's because we're afraid to fail. We're really afraid to fail because if in a kindergarten someone says, I really think we need to start with the spaghetti, they'll probably just start with the spaghetti. But if a business school student, I feel bad. Like I didn't go to business school. I have an MA in, in the arts, which is awesome. But um, I do feel kind of bad for them because imagine having to like cross check and like run calculations on whether or not you can start with spaghetti. That kills all the creativity and innovation you could possibly want. And then we don't iterate. So if something doesn't work once, as an adult, we walk away. We're like, well, uh, yeah, that didn't quite work out how I wanted it to, so I'm not gonna iterate. Now, being in the startup world, we iterate all the time. If we didn't, we would, we would essentially die. But iteration is critical. We don't collaborate necessarily. Um, we're afraid of offending someone instead of trying to get a, a build a bridge, close a gap, we hold off because we're not sure if what we are going to say is going to be offensive. We see a lot of people being punished for saying things that then turned out to be really, really wrong. And that's really hard. And it's actually not helping our relationships. And we're not that great at having equal distributed conversation. An equal distributed conversation refers to just giving people the time that they need to talk. And I don't mean everybody needs 33.3% time to talk when there's three people in the room. I don't mean that. I mean, some people need more words to process and others need like six words and then they've said what they needed to and they do it at the end of the meeting. Both are fine, but it's, it needs to be distributed that everybody feels like, okay, this is the way I'm gonna show up. Um, I wanna switch to this one example uh, and just make sure you're still paying attention. Uh, there's a, a, a an example I want to share with you of these two ice hockey teams. And Team A, it's 2014, they received a huge financial investment from their country. They were all superstar players on this ice hockey team. They were expected to win 
And they were ho hosting the Olympics the year that they needed to compete. These guys have been training their whole life. This was their moment. They're so good. They're going to win. Their country pumped all this money into them. They were going to win Team B. 1980 they were put together a, uh, like less than a year before the olympics they made up they were made up of amateur and college athletes the bar was low it was basically like don't embarrass us that was what their country said like guys just don't embarrass us and and it'll be fine which team won their respective olympics was it team a i know see no one's going to raise their hand because they're like, it can't be. That's too easy. She wouldn't be talking about this if it, you know. Yeah, well, clearly it's Team B. You guys are smart. <laughs> Very smart. It's Team B. But the cool thing about this is, um, okay, so this is not the cool thing, but Team A was eliminated before the rounds began. Team B brought home gold. The cool thing about this was, is that a lot of these skills that I mentioned earlier that the kindergartners had, trust. Okay, imagine you're going to the Olympics and you've got like less than a year. What are you gonna do with your teammates? You're gonna not trust them? You better freaking trust them or you're not even gonna hit the ice, right? So they trusted, they collaborated. They didn't really worry about the outcome. They just went to really create something magnificent together. There's a movie about this, by the way. This is a true story. Team A was the Russian um, ice hockey team and team, team B was the US, but I'm not saying that because I sound like an American. I'm just giving you some facts. <laughs> As you know, I'm not American. Um, but anywho, so this, this is really cool because this is going back to this concept of that being an expert at something doesn't actually necessarily make us very good. In fact, it can blind us. So this team of experts that we saw, Team A, they were blinded maybe by their um, by their ego or by all this money that came streaming in or by these expectations their, con their country had of them. Whereas Team B, they were a bunch of outsiders trying to make the most of it. And this concept of outsiders is very much covered in a book called Range by David Epstein. And what David Epstein refers to as this outsider idea is that when an existing group is introduced to a new way of thinking, their chances of success increase exponentially. So let that sink in. When a new group is introduced to a new way of thinking, their chances of success increase exponentially. And the funny thing is, this is crazy, but that person that they add to that group, they don't even need to say anything. They can just sit there quietly. You know, this is nuts. You have one group that's completely the same and an outsider gets added and already there's more chances of success because that one group in Dutch, I think you would say, is a beetje op de hoede, op hun hoede, op hun hoede. I think it's op de hoede, but oh, A, B or C, <laughs> it was B. Um, no, but you know, they're, they're paying more attention because all of a sudden there's an outsider, so they have to be a little bit more mindful. So. If anything that you do in 2023 and you need to expand your team, just throw in an outsider because you're already going to get better just by having them there. But if you don't do this, <laughs> your chances actually of collapse increase exponentially because you've got no one cross checking you. And you know the story. We saw it with the with banking. We see it all the time when people that are so good at something, they have this expert tunnel vision and they don't remember what it is that they're doing wrong or where they need to pay a little more attention. Um, but that's hard. And why is that hard? It's hard because we've got this dominant thing going on. So let me explain a little bit about what I mean. Um, let me see how this lands, but I figured I will trust you and I shall take a risk. But um, as a gentleman, have you ever uh, walked into an elevator with only women in it? Yeah. Yeah. It's and uh, it, this is absolutely a safe space. This is a safe space. Hundreds. I normally start by saying that, but we felt intimate today, so I assumed it was safe. It is. Thank you, sir. Um, women, have you ever been in an elevator with all women and a man walks in? And um, the, the whole dynamic shifts and like we're all like, oh, no one knows what to do with this new information. It's like we're literally in an elevator. It's, and um, and the man always, almost always says something. He's like, oh, <laughs> morning, ladies. 
And the women are like, oh, okay, I guess we'll stop talking about everything that we were just talking about, right? We immediately adjust to the social dynamic. It's really fascinating. Um, switch roles. Women feel like this often, um, especially when we when we work in in spaces where a section of our identity that we identify with isn't being represented in the group that we engage. And that's that that's neither here nor there. I'm leaving it. That's not what I'm talking about right now. I'm just talking about that that general experience. So that's why I mentioned this dominant structure, right? So if you if you have an elephant and a mouse in the same room, what does the elephant need to know about the mouse to survive? That what elephant needs to know that the a lot of little mice. Uh, yeah, fair, fair, um, but not much. The mouse won't hurt him, yeah. Essentially, the, the, the elephant doesn't need to know too much about the mouse to survive. But what does the mouse need to know about the elephant to survive? Where, where yeah, love it. Thank you so much. A lot, the location where this elephant is going to step next the move it's going to make and and i i'm giving you this example of this this story because sometimes when we are not part of a dominant group we're spending a hell of a lot of energy trying to figure out where that dominant group is going and that's tiring at best that's tiring at best it's a lot of mental calculations that have to be made all the time just to do your job. So if you associate with someone in the dominant group, and by the way, you can be in both groups at the same time. You can be in the dominant group because you're an extrovert, but you all of a sudden are in a country relocated for Boscales where you're not in the dominant group anymore. You can also be in the non-dominant group um, because you're an introvert, but you happen to be the traditional um, you know, I'll, I'll characteristic right now that we consider dominant. So you can be in both groups. You can be in one group more than others. You can be in one group in the Netherlands and in a whole other group in Maastricht. Um, so you can play these two roles. But be mindful because this dynamic says a lot about DNI, about diversity and inclusion and your ability to understand the, the, the place where you are and how to include the others. In a couple of years ago, um, NASA had to do, they had to, re, this is actually awesome, they had to reinvent, they were rethinking the food that they were sending astronauts up into space with. All of a sudden it needed to be gluten free. It's not true, it didn't need to be gluten free. But um, they wanted to rethink what they were packaging in those little packages. Um, for any of you who have ever worked in a war zone type of country, you might have also had these. Um, they don't taste great, but but they're fun. But yeah, so NASA needed to kind of reinvent some of the chemicals and the, the, the makeup of this food, and they just couldn't figure it out as a team together. So they went to a company called Innocentive, and Innocentive is a platform that sources ideas from all over the world to solve problems that companies like NASA could have. And what's amazing about Innocentive, guess how much percent of the winning submissions, so, so NASA will get like three submissions, right? Um, three, three teams around the world that are like, we think we can solve this food challenge for you, NASA. Guess the amount of challenges that, that are, are chosen as the eventual winner by these companies like NASA actually have somebody that works in that, in that industry an astronaut or an aerospace engineer. It's like zero. The people that come with suggestions for these companies literally have nothing to do with the industry over and over again. And that's that outsider thing that I was telling you about. So now in 2023, you're expanding your team. You're like, OK, I'm going to check the box. Like I'm going to throw that outsider in. But that's amazing because that's your, you're going to find a lot of solutions there. But we heard it earlier this morning as well. All of that only works when we start considering some of the diversity perspectives and some of the steps we need to take to actually emphasize that those skills are welcome. 
so that that mouse isn't freaking out the whole time that it might end up under the elephant's massive foot. So we get comfortable around neurodiversity. That feels reasonably comfortable to us now. We can try and understand that people's brains work differently. As long as we don't have to talk about the way that we look, we can touch it, right? Neurodiversity, we all know that our brains are different. And we see that the world is starting to adopt to some of these practices. In fact, Microsoft has a great program on neurodiversity, but ran into another challenge, which was hiring neurodiverse people. Can anybody imagine what their challenge might have been? Why Microsoft, fantastic company, now has this great program to get neurodiverse people in. Why are they not hiring them? Please. They don't apply for positions. I love that suggestion. Thank you. Um, that's not quite, I'm sure that that has something to do with it. There's something else I'm looking for. They didn't know what to ask. That's getting much closer indeed. Yes, please. They didn't. Okay, fair. They did, or maybe they weren't picking up on the clues of interaction of these. Yes, we don't. Yeah, we don't go what we we don't do what we don't know. Yeah, yeah. for sure. All very good responses. Um, yes, please, sir. Oh, okay, very cool. That that might be something that happens later on in the journey. Um, I appreciate you sharing. In this case, I'm thinking a little bit more about what it took to actually hire neurodiverse people. Um, but but thank you. So what they found was that the, you know, this 45 minute interview process. Seriously, what? I mean, it is the worst. You're sitting in front of one person who has a whole different lived experience. You don't know anything about them and they're going to judge whether or not you're capable for a job. So what you were saying earlier, ma'am, about this uh, recognition thing, that's very important. If we're trying to hire neurodiverse people and we're subjecting everybody to the same type of process, that doesn't really work. So Microsoft realized that they needed to spend a week and it was completely different. It wasn't sitting, you know, across from one another and having a 45 minute conversation about what would make you good at this position and tell me a little bit more about what you did between 1993 and 1997. That doesn't work for some people. So if you're trying to attract these people into your company, how are you doing that? So that's kind of the first thing that we need to start paying attention to. If you want somebody else on your team, or if you want to get better at this, what message are you putting out there? And that's why I said point number two, sort yourself out first. Um, but we know neurodiversity is important, not just because we want that um, diversity in the group, but also because it gets us to analogical thinking. And analogical thinking is really, really important because analogical thinking allows us to synthesize different pieces of data and draw conclusions in a smarter way. And that's why those people that are supplying their solutions to uh, NASA and to other companies, they have no idea. They don't, they don't work in that space because they don't, they don't become an inundated by that conversation. They're drawing their experience from a whole bunch of other areas. And this is what gets us to this diversity and why diversity of thought works. And then that key pillar, that safety thing. We heard, it, heard about it a little bit this morning, psychological safety. I wanna spend a little bit of time on that, but I also wanna go back to this idea of um, what happens when we, when we start to try and hire or think differently about this diverse talent that we, we now wanna have on board. So imagine companies are scared to hire international talent. This is a very real thing. Um, we say things like, well, this is a this is a real example. That's why it says Canada is the language barrier. You know, they don't have Canadian experience and I'm not sure they will be a good cultural fit. And for any of you that have been to Canada, it's like the melting pot. I studied in Canada, actually in Toronto, amazing city, and um, it was super multicultural. So this is quite particular that this would be a Canadian example. But if you really think about what, an, for example, this international student that they that this company could be hiring this new talent with a different background than what they're traditionally used to. Just actually think about it for a second. And then compare it to what you know in your reality, right? So an international student might have left home as young as 15. They land in a country with no support network. They don't speak the language. 
It's like me having to drive here. It's like, it's very stressful. There are a lot of signs. Um, you have to learn how to an navigate an entirely new system that comes for granted to people who already live there. These kids get incredible grades while they do it. They find resourceful ways to build relationships. They become independent in their early 20s. They support their family back home. They're driven by knowledge of sacrifices that it took to get there because they've seen generations of their family do that. So we have all these ideas about someone or something when actually looking a little bit deeper at the person who they are and how they got to where they are today. That says a lot. One of my developers is in Odessa in Ukraine. And um, I, put, I put no pressure on him for timelines because I know what I know that he's doing what he can with his work. But, you know, he's got his seven year old daughter and his 10 year old son and they're in a bunker and they don't have electricity. And, you know, every work, every piece of work that he's putting out for the team right now, I just I really do feel like, wow, you know, you're really like it's hard. Because that's what I'm talking about when I say those lived experiences. And for those of you that have traveled a little bit with your roles, you might remember that from going to countries where there's load shedding, for example, like in South Africa, or where there aren't as many rules on the road, like in the Middle East, where it's e Egypt's pretty hard for drivers. I do not want to drive in Egypt. Um, imagine the Aambe Bay there, they'd have a field day. But, you know, there's so many, so many different things that come to play here. So I'm suggesting to you today while you go through this process of unlearning and while you go through this process of sorting yourself out first, that you take a moment with a CV or you take a moment with a profile or you take a moment when someone says something to you to ask a few questions. And if you're worried about asking because you don't want to ask the wrong thing, then say, I feel a bit worried about asking this question, but be vulnerable in that moment. Like I said, this is literally a learning journey for all of us. So I want to swing back to a few definitions. I've touched on a, a, a few concepts and I don't want to assume that we're all on the same page. Homogeneity now means everything's pretty much the same. And diversity is when we start talking about bringing in that diversity, uh, those concepts in, which I know you are actively doing as a company, which is great. So we know that this is important. Um, everybody's talking about it. We we get it. It feels better. I think this, this, this has been an issue the whole time, so I hope some kind of miracle can happen in post-production. Um, but why are we so bad at this diversity thing if we know it matters? Well, we've got our bias, right? Implicit bias, unconscious bias, and coded bias. Coded bias is going to become more important now with artificial intelligence. Um, think of it this way. Hieroglyphics had 7,000. There were 7,000 hieroglyphics back in the day. And now there's like two main languages that we speak on Earth. So why do I say that? What we are coding right now what we are teaching our machines right now is very much based on one narrative. So be really mindful of that. The coded, coded bias is going to be a big problem. We have skewed reporting lines, unconstructive cognitive patterns, and we reject constructive conflict. I believe, bless you, I believe that for your company here, Boscalis, this, this one, rejecting constructive conflict, could be interesting for you to consider. The Dutch, I am one of you. Oh my God, I'm sweating at the idea of getting any kind of conversation with a Dutch person because it's uh, recht voor zijn rap. Um, and for those of you that don't speak Dutch, I hope my body language indicated what I was trying to say, but it can be very intense speaking with a Dutch person. And, and quite frankly, you know, Dutch people think it's okay, but it's also a little bit rude sometimes. And it can be very rude in some cultures. And I'm not saying that's that's bad or that's good. I do see that I swear to God, the five people that raised their hand that said they didn't associate with being Dutch are like literally nodding. Um, Dutch people are like, no, this is going to be the sign. But it is. Um, and that's OK. It's not bad. It's also what makes Dutch people beautiful and and strong and clear. But know your audience, right? Know your audience. And this constructive conflict thing is super important. But all of us deal with conflict in a different way. Um, it's also not fun to sit in a meeting where everyone's nodding their head yes, and then you go back to your outlook and you're like, well, based on the meeting, I think we are ready to go ahead. And then it's like crickets. So, you know, know your audience. Um, and finally, that inability to trust. We're scared to make mistakes and we go to what we know, as you had said. Um, 
these we we all do this. We're coded to do this. So I'm I'm seriously suggesting that you become super mindful. I had to teach myself how to be be with my mom again. I had to listen to her cues now. And that's okay. I'm on, I'm on a journey with that and I'm I'm I think we all are. So keep these in the back of your mind and then take active steps to improve them on a day-to-day -day basis even if it's just a little micro moment way. Um, and speaking of micro, as I was getting to know your teams and, and learning a little bit more about what might be relevant to you, we did talk a little bit about microaggressions as well. And microaggressions are those little statements that we make like, I don't know if there's many Americans, they're, they're still sleeping. So I'm going to say this and then don't tell them I said it, but they're so funny because they'll be like, oh, but you don't have an accent. <laughs> You sound like totally American. You sound you don't have an accent at all. I'm like, you guys, I don't have an accent because I sound like you. I do have an accent. It's just an American one. But that's what I'm talking about, a microaggression. And that's a funny one. That's a nice one. They go, they, there's a whole range of microaggressions. Be mindful. And if you're not sure you just kind of overstepped, ask. You can literally say, hey, I feel the energy between us just shifted. Did I say something that doesn't work? I'm really sorry, I'm trying to learn. If someone said that to you, would you be open to receiving that? Yeah, I see you nodding your heads. You would be open to receiving that because that's general, that's a genuine, that's vulnerable. So, okay, cognitive diversity leads to cognitive intelligence. Um, this is where we start talking about why everything that I've been talking about today actually matters on your teams moving forward. Um, so we have our worldview, our lived experiences. Those are made up of things that we know to be true, things that we learned in school, the books that we read, um, how we perceive the world. So how we see things, if we grew up in Utrecht or if we grew up all over the world or if we're from Ghana, it doesn't matter. How we perceive is shaped by many, many different things. How we solve problems, how does our brain like to solve problems? I like to create, I like to move, I like to draw, design, write. There are my notebooks right there. I have notes about your company in there um, but and uh, some of us like to just sit alone and how we connect what's our what's our modus of connecting do we want to connect every day do we need physical connection are we okay being alone big chunks of the time so these are all the ways you know, there are many more but these are some ways in which we structure our being and the way in which we relate at the workplace so we know this cognitive diversity where we all bring different skills is very important we know that we have to be mindful of finding it. So the process of a 45 minute interview might not work, especially when I already gave the examples and I'm mindful of time, um, but we know we have to do it. So as we're on this journey of DNI here at Boscalis, how are you going to find this cognitive diversity? Look for lived experiences. Look what somebody did in their three year gap. Ask questions. What kind of family are they supporting? What's their home country like? If they're dealing with load shedding like your colleagues in South Africa, eight hours a day, that's 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 mentally brutal. That is brutal. So start thinking about things like that. Different perspectives. Do you sit across from somebody that thrives in conflict? OK but not everybody does. So where do you need to adjust? And I'm not saying change who you are. Everybody's unique and perfect in the way that they are, but it's not a kindergarten class, but we are. Um, but still be mindful and, and, and listen to what that other, per listen to the data that you're getting. So for the moment supreme while you're waiting, um, what I've been speaking about this morning, all of this DNI stuff, it's, it's, it's actually pretty, pretty interesting. To date, we've really looked at this like traditional top performer and we have a pretty good idea of what he looks like. It's about a meter uh, one meter 80. Uh, he's a white guy and he's kind of tall and you know, maybe his name is like David Smith. Um, he's X amount of experience and he went to this like reasonable, like pretty good school and um, he maybe studied some kind of like strong subject, like a finance thing or business, but this is traditionally, traditionally the profile of a top performer and a high IQ. And maybe he played lacrosse, I don't know. Um, and ironically, I'm pretty sure I Googled, you know, like, um, a CV, like I put in like CV in Google and I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I didn't even have to like look. Like I think this David Smith here, he 
he came up. I think, doesn't he live in, he lives in Marleybone. <laughs> Interesting. Um, for those of you that have been to Marleybone, you'll know it's quite a beautiful area of London. Anywho, long story short, we have an idea of these top performers. Okay, so now let's go back to this, this, this platform I gave you, what we know, how we perceive, how we solve, and how we connect. So, Team A is hiring a new team, all right? They are going to hire this top performer right here. Awesome. Team B is also hiring a new team, and they are also hiring a top performer. Same, similar, pro, similar profile. Team B needs to add a team member, and team, you know, the first person wants to work with somebody that they know, the profile that they understand, so they're just going to hire the same type of profile. Team B is hiring, um, they just have, they have less, less of a budget because they started with a minority, so they have a little bit less salary to, oh, anyway, they're, whatever, they found somebody's economics major, um, experience in business and finance, which is great, um, and also the primary caretaker of two families, so it's like a whole bunch of like different lived experiences now, makes them more patient, but also makes them a little bit less, um, you know, can't work 16 hour days, basically. Team A hires that similar profile again. Um, team B is looking at somebody who's in a career transi transition, but has loads of leadership experience. Really interesting person. Uh, team A, again, that similar profile, they're really going, plus they're, they're, they're recruiting where they go for lunch as well, right? Because they're very, very busy people. So they just hired that this person came along for lunch and also happened to go to a good school. So that worked out quite nicely. The other team now is thinking ahead a little bit, like what kind of skills do we need for the future? Maybe that AI thing is going to blow up. It did in December. Um, so they had already put someone on their team who had this experience. Team B, you know, they're still in that kind of similar team structure. And now uh, Team A, sorry, and Team B is looking at somebody who went to a liberal, I finally got a job, guys. <laughs> that liberal arts degree finally paid off. Um, but, you know, somebody who might have a completely different profile again. So you know this, you know that this is now, this is this is a diverse team versus a less diverse team, hom homogeneous team, and we've spoken a little bit about collective intelligence. So why does this matter? Well, if we look at it and we look at what we now, the skills that we have on each of these teams, this is basically, up until this point, it's like the same, right? We knew that these skills were covered by both teams, but then this one team, they just like have a whole bunch of other skills on here. And this is great because in 2023, we actually need all these skills, right? Because we can't predict our world anymore the way that we used to when team A was the winning team because all they had to do was plant um, a seed to grow a tree or they worked in a factory. It was way more predictable, way more repetitive. So team A was fine then, but it's not fine anymore. So you see now we've got the same level of intelligence on both sides. Those skills were covered, remember? that MBA, we've got those skills, they're there. But this other team has way more colorful skills here that are needed in this rapidly changing world, which means that their diversity of thought bubble is just bigger. There's, there's more opportunity to solve things in a smarter way. And quite frankly, we need that. We need all these skills because our world is a mess. It's an absolute mess. So you're not only not doing your company or your team justice, you're actually setting it up for failure if you don't pay attention to this stuff. Because repeating this top performer profile means we limit our ability to innovate. It doesn't allow us to consider diverse perspectives. We scare off future talent and it's not sustainable. So if we have that same profile repeated across the upper echelon of an organization, i.e. the board and trickling down, it's a reason why great ideas die. And if you don't have great ideas, you're never going to build that high tower. So this diversity thing, it really trumps ability. And, and people don't want to believe this, but honestly, diverse perspectives in solving complex problems. I'm not talking about the problems we need to solve 20 or 30 years ago, factory line problems. Time and a place? Absolutely. I'm talking about the world today. Diverse perspectives and solving complex problems leads to increased cognitive diversity. We achieve cognitive diversity when our teams think different. Increased cognitive diversity leads to an increase in collective intelligence. And we can only achieve that. We thought you thought we were there. Well, we've got three minutes. We can only achieve this when we do one thing, which was mentioned this morning, which is that safety piece. So we've got a world now that has many different world states. And I said to you, you know, we don't want to believe that this is true because 
we go to what we know and our brains are coded to do that. But think different because it's no longer going to serve the purpose of today or tomorrow. Many experiments have been run to prove these theories that I'm sharing with you today, making sure that they're no longer theories, but that they're actually hard coded facts. So they've been done by computer programming models where teams with different agents, i.e. different characters, different people are set to compete and solve game like challenges across a variety of states. Um, I can share this paper with you. It's very academic. I throw it in here because sometimes people are like, well, this was really floopy. Trust me, my team and I build these algorithms. Um, it's what I do on the side. So I really respect the importance of also using different types of data input to get to the results that we want to explore. Um, so we talked a little bit earlier about diversity. We, we, we said these two, remember? There's two more that you could take into consideration a worldview. How does that person look at the world? What is their state of mind? As an entrepreneur, I love people that have a fantastic mindset. I actually don't really worry that much about exactly what school or whatever. I, I, I know you know this as well. But how do they look at the world? How do they feel about the world? What are they bringing? What kind of energy are they bringing to the team? And also organizational diversity. I love this idea of getting really young people on the board. So I work in education and, and inclusion, and I really like to include kids in decision making. I love how like adults are making decisions about school for kids. That makes no sense. We're not in it. So what you know? What kind of diversity do we need? Um, a lot of it is the answer, but we also need that key ingredient, which is safety. And safety comes from different skills that we actually all have, but that might be a little bit under tapped because they're more somatic, meaning they live in the body and not so much in the head, but we happen to celebrate the head. We get really excited about the brain, which is great. It's beautiful, but there's also a lot going on in our physical reality. So reading the eyes, understanding and connecting beyond just words, um, creating psychological safety, taking a moment to establish that something is a safe space, giving some time, giving some space for people to be themselves, and making sure that if you feel like you've overstepped, you go back and cross-check where appropriate. And if you don't do this, if you don't start to develop this type of safety, you lose out on a lot of great ideas. And when I mentioned some of those models earlier, um, you'll, you'll have felt it undoubtedly, Maybe it's happened to you where you didn't express something because you didn't feel safe, but you might have also felt it as a leader where you did something and somebody else was like, oh, God, oh um, I guess I can't express myself here. Um, we ran some experiments that had these small teams of 10 people. And you see that if the CEO has an idea, it always, um, it almost always goes through. But if somebody else, in that hierarchy has an idea, the less safe that they feel, the less likely it is that their idea will even see the light of day. Um, now, I'm not going to say Amazon is an amazing company. I definitely have very strong, not so great feelings about Jeff Bezos. But one thing I do appreciate is that a product manager, I think, was the one to pitch Amazon Prime, the subscription model, one of the main sources of income for Amazon. So ingrained in that was, hey, if you have a great idea, it doesn't really matter where it comes from. And if that's not part of your culture here, then please take that away today. Please take that away because there's a really big uh, opportunity lost cost if there's no space for those great ideas to make it to light. So then we scan thousands upon thousands of ideas Look, using a UCT model where you start com comparing levels of safety, how safe people feel to the likelihood of their um, idea making it, them expressing it, how they felt like they were appreciated by their team. Um, and I want to bring you to the results. I'm mindful of time and I really want to do questions. Um, so I'm going a bit fast now. Hmm. 
essentially, um, I want to get to a little bit about how to develop that psychological safety so that we can we can touch on that. And then I want to honor your questions as well. Um, but. I don't want to do these stats. OK. As I mentioned, yeah, I know you saw McKinsey. You're like, OK, that must mean it's all true. It's like we, we have to put that in there at the end. Um, we are at a we're at a, a at a crazy place in society right now, and some of you might have noticed it not just because of what's happened with COVID, but also with Chat GPT. This is what we think because humans are really good at linear, right? We're really good at linear. We're not so good at exponential because this is actually what we're facing. It's like my favorite chart. This is tomorrow, and so being really good at this stuff and making sure that you do have an AI specialist or you do have a um, mental health specialist on your team. Those things are really, really important. So we go back to these two teams. Um, even though we know that team B is stronger in performing and solving complex problems, they're less confident in doing so. And why is that? Why would team B be less confident? They are overperforming. They've got a larger set of skills and those skills are needed in a complex world. Why are they less confident than team A? Please. I saw the hand here and then yes, please. Oh, I love that you're saying that. I'm going to put that in the next re iteration of this presentation and then I will credit you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's really exhausting to know a lot, isn't it? <laughs> no, I love that you're saying that, but no, it's actually, so despite outperformance, these diverse teams are less confident than the homogenous teams. Um, here are three options. Um, it's actually because they, they spend more time discussing. So because they're a little more like, okay, you know, this all matters, like let's take into consideration and don't be like the Dutch government, okay? <laughs> don't discuss everything with every single voice. There's, there's a limit, <laughs> but no, I'm kidding. Please don't tell them I said that, but okay. Um, you have to strike a nice balance there, right? So these teams that are considered non-traditional or non-dominant, they're actually spending more time discussing. They're not assuming that everything that they say is the right way. And that's because that's awkward. That, that just doesn't give you a good solution. So we know we have to have those discussions. We need to be mindful of the co the constructive conflict that we're having having in order to get through to breakthrough thinking. We still aren't great at this, and these are three things I really think you need to focus on within yourself. Is there a fear of dismissal? Is there a fear of being seen as challenging? And is there a fear of being seen as different? Whatever your fear might be, it could, could be outside of these three. But be mindful of it because your perspective on something is probably very critical. Think about the way in which you phrase it and people will probably be quite receptive. So I'm going to end on this example, not necessarily because my presentation ends here, but because I really want to have a discussion with you. So to tie all this together, in an operating room um, where nurses have the opportunity to challenge or suggest or make a like an improvement to to the doctor. The chances of survival are 50% higher. So if none of this, if, if you don't care about any of this today that I said, which is fine. Which operating table would you rather be on? One where there's safety for people to express their ideas and to say, excuse me, doctor, I, I really don't think that we should be doing that right now or one where that's not allowed. It could mean life or death for you. If you're further interested in these studies, um, I'm happy to share them after this lecture as well. But this is serious, so um, yeah, it's serious and fun, which is a very good way to live. I wanna open up for questions because I'm mindful of time. Please. Yes, of course. We're talking about changing, we're talking about changing behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about uh, the situation at which we have, humans have never been in before. Uh, it took us quite some time to come where we are. We had the Industrial Revolution, we then had some wars, and then we have an information revolution now going on. 
why do you think that we can transform so fast while we know this is going to take time? Because we know cognitively that we should not be afraid for a piece of rope in our tent at night because it will not probably not be a snake, but we're safe. We know it cognitively, but, but still we act like it and we don't want to. I don't want to act sometimes like a dominant man. And I don't want to be approached by women like I'm a dominant man, but these things still happen. Why do we think we can change that by just knowing about it? Because you look at our systems, they are still more or less the same as they are. Thank you. Um, are you comfortable sharing your name? Yes, of course. Hans Peter, HP. Hans, nice to meet you. Um, no, not Hans, oh, Hans Peter. Hans Peter, <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, no, that's Joel not a Sterks. problem. Nice no, no, to meet no, you. No, no. That is exactly what I'm talking about for because sure. you are not aware that I'm the name Hans has a certain meaning for me, which I'm, which nobody's aware of. So it's not Hans, it's Hans Peter or HP. Would you like to share your the meaning of your name? No, you? not no? well. Just the fact that it's not Hans because Hans was the name of my father which was not named like that. So it's an entire story behind, but it's just an example of how these things work. Well, I do not want to feel like that in this instance. That's okay. Yeah, I know. No, I appreciate you sharing. Maybe we should go to Nigeria together and then I'll be like, I was named after city and you can be like, well, I was not named after my father and it'll be great. Look, um, no, I appreciate you. I appreciate you saying that. Thank you very, very much. Um, so no, I don't believe that we can. Oh, how depressing, right? Happy Friday. I don't necessarily know or believe that we can, so I can share with you some best practices if you're open to receiving. The first is I'm very empathetic to your experience of not wanting to feel like a dominant man. And I'm not standing in front of you saying, um, yeah, well, you shouldn't feel like a dominant man. In fact, actually, I like to think of life in polarities. I try to think less of man and woman or however one may associate. And I like to think of it more in terms of energy. And sometimes a um, different type of energy is required to bring a solution to its next phase. And sometimes that is a dominant energy. Having had much of that dominant energy as a little girl growing up and then being told I shouldn't, I, I think maybe there's a piece of things I can relate to, except I'm lucky because I'm five foot three and I'm not a dominant man. Right. So first of all, I really appreciate you sharing this and I, I, I really am grateful that you did. And I don't think you should feel that you can't be that energy in the situation that requires it. So what might be next for you is learning how to tune in with your team to the right extent so that they understand where you're coming from and why your energy is reflecting in that moment. We are functioning excellent at our team because we are built around people like me. Yeah, we are now, you know, you're, 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 you're describing, of course, situations which do not apply to all lines of work we're in. Mm -hmm. We are not making up new things. We are just performing the crunching work and, and try to, uh, in all kinds of ways. We're lawyers, by the way. Oh. We're, yeah. <laughs> but our main, there, we there we go again. Our main Ryan, function. Why did I take it? Who gave the microphone to this man? <laughs> what? I just asked Why would you it. give a microphone to a lawyer? I have a liberal arts degree, people. Yes, but but you may be not aware. I shall main, improvise our, my way out of it. No, no, no. That, no that's, please, it's not a discussion. It's just sharing about about what what we as lawyers trying to do is to understand the other side, and the beauty of working for a company like Boscalis, of course, do the inter, in international setting, which makes it even more difficult. So you're just trying to understand why is this somebody saying how how is the power being divided on the other side? How can I get the best result out of myself for ourselves? Absolutely. So let's go back to you. You have because you really are saying two things. You're saying there's that thing about how do I why do why do we expect things to change so fast when we are not physically or mentally actually able to do that? And the second thing I hear you say is this is dominant man and it's not. A, I get the sense that you're saying it might not always be welcome or you're not sure how to you don't want people to look. You said you don't want people to look at you that way, please. I, and I, I want to be mindful of other questions and I'm very happy to engage with you further because I do think what you're saying is incredibly important. Like I said, you're making it, you and society are making it very much about dominant man. And I'm talking in terms of energy. And that's actually really qu quite cool because when you start thinking of it more in terms of energy, and this may or may not be received by everybody today, which I respect because we're all in different stages of this journey. So this is this is not a good or a bad thing. 
when you say this energy of yours and that certain parts of the company thrive on that type of energy of yours, your team thrives on that type of energy, I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it. But the point is that there's space for every type of energy at different times of that cycle. So when you ask me why, you know, why could it be possible that we could change according to the needs of today? And I'm telling you, not really. That's because I don't believe personally that people take enough time for the other side of it. And so I have a notebook. I try not to write in my, on my laptop too much. Because I know for my processing, I need to write hand on paper. And we have expectations of processes um, and, and those balances. I, I see a massive gap in our ability as human beings to actually be as a human. We spend a lot of time in our heads. Yeah, only, only. That, I can that's imagine. Where we live, yeah. yeah, I try not to. And um, I do, try do, to. Do you succeed? Yeah, I do quite a bit, but I, I, but it's conscious because it really happened after COVID. Because then I was like, this is not how my life is going to go ever again, ever. I will, I refuse. I also know that the energy of creation, particularly on a, now again, I'm going to talk about energy on a feminine embodiment, which also lives in, in the male body, but creation actually happens a lot from that space. And if I, as a speaker, as an author, don't tap into it, it also doesn't work. But you as a lawyer also need to be able to tap into innovative, creative ways of looking at, especially global law, where you can synthesize different things that you need to take into oh, account. We, oh, we wish it doesn't work like that. But that's but that's fine. We, I, I I appreciate your views on it. Thank you very much. And I don't want to dominate the discussion. <laughs> uh, so, Jos, I want to thank you very much for this lecture. Um, what I indeed see is that we really uh, tend to make up a team of people that are really like us. Um, and that is indeed like, uh, I don't know where it comes from. Where does that come from and how do we start changing it? Because what you just point out, I, I really believe in that. Uh, I also try to do it, so try to be more inclusive and have a more diversity. But will we struggle? What what are like? Uh, can you give us some tips, some uh, some tricks to to start that? I can, and I'm just going to go ahead here and um, go like a little bit further on my slides. It's like I can show you this slide, right? Great. I hope that's the lot. Okay, cool. Um, what was your name? Joel. Nice to meet you, Joel. Thank you for your question. You mentioned that you are actively trying to do to be more inclusive. Without looking at the screen, Joel, <laughs> tell me what you do. What what does that look like for you? So in my team, um, I work in the Dutch division here in uh, Voskalis, Nederland. So in my team, I try to um, really ask all the team members what they think, and I try to see whether they need uh, to express themselves in the group or outside the group. Um, uh, but I'm not the, the one to, uh, to compose the team, uh, so I don't have influence on whether we uh, hire diverse persons or just the, the the technicians from Delft, I would say. Uh, and in my personal life, I try to engage with other cultures, which is really hard also, but really beautiful. So I see the beauty, but it's hard. Yeah, Joel, thank you so much. It is hard. You're right. So I appreciate you sharing that. And can you tell us a little bit about your team makeup? What, what does your team look like today? Uh, my team... It looks like um, so uh, me myself as a team leader to uh, to make the design. Uh, I have a couple of designers who are specialists um, from Delft, I would say, who calculate the stuff. We, uh, they are both uh, they are, uh, three men, about 30 years old. 
Uh, then we have. Uh, Are they from the Netherlands? Yes. They're all Dutch. Um, and then we have one person who is influencing uh, the. I don't know the word for omgevings manager. Someone should help me. But Surrounding uh, man like environment manager. Oh, you mean the technical? No, 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 no. Who tries to sell it to the to the stakeholder, the stakeholder management? Yeah. Oh, like, yeah, cool. Yeah, uh, who is a woman of forty years old? And so, wow, that's very diverse. <laughs> <laughs> so we got four. We got four men, around like between thirty and forty. Uh, one woman, and uh, yeah, so that's that's the the sub team I work in. Okay, cool. Um, thank you also, Joel, for your question and for sharing this openly. I really appreciate it. I don't think you're alone. I don't think you're unique. And we just heard from Hans Peter that it is a larger structure and a larger system that everybody's operating in. So I can stand here and tell you. Ask what your team thinks, check in with yourself. I mean, the list is right here. You can totally take a picture. You know, it's these are the things that you can do all the time. But Joel, I really think that your sphere of influence now and as you continue in your career, that's going to grow. So you said something interesting and the biggest mistake we do. This is not my quote, but the biggest thing we do as people is we give up our power. We think we don't have any. And you said something really interesting. You said, I can't really influence who we hire. So I would start by asking yourself, OK, yes, you have X amount of skills. By the way, AI is really going to help you, I think, because soon you can give some of your tasks to co computers so your 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 Delft guys can do other stuff. Um, but it also gives you some space to think about more expansive ways to get jobs done. Um, your sphere as a leader in, is going to grow as your career grows, and that includes something called boundary spanning and becoming an equity advocate. And those are very practical things you can do, Joel. When I talk about boundary spanning, I'm talking about setting up meetings once a week where instead of talking to your team or including your team, you talk to somebody in HR, you talk to somebody outside of the industry, you get on a call with a colleague in Nigeria, you speak to somebody in a different time zone just to get a different percep perception perspective. Just you do what you can that 30 minutes a week where you start having a conversation outside. And this is critical because it allows you to bridge gaps beyond what's just happening in your team. You are actively seeking input from different opinions. If you can do, if you've got 30 minutes every other week or so, start inviting and you're looking for actions, start inviting in different voices. You don't have to hire them today if your sphere of influence doesn't let you affect that process yet. Equally though, Joel, if I were you, I would get maybe some other people. So you've all heard Joel's situation. If you resonate, please connect with Joel at boscalis.nl and send him an email and say, hey, Joel, I recognize what you're saying. Maybe we should have a chat with HR. And I'm not saying it's going to happen today, Joel. I don't know what else your intentions are for 2023, but perhaps you can sneak one more on there. Try and get somebody on your team that might not fit that profile and talk to your Tayu Delft guys, because you know what, Joel, do it for me. The more Tayu Delft guys you talk to, the easier my life becomes. Really? So if you want to just start there, do us all a favor and talk to those guys. Now, the fact that you care says a lot. I'm very grateful that you do. And I'm glad that you're looking at actions that you can take to actually make a concerted change. That's boundary spanning. The second thing I said was equity advocacy. I really, really don't like the term male champions. It is a joke. OK, humanity. So first of all, when I say equity advocacy, I'm talking about if you can recognize, Joel, that your life might be easier in certain ways because of certain things and it's harder in certain ways because of certain things and you can do that for yourself, you can probably also do that for another colleague. So, for example, somebody who's not speaking their native tongue, which you just had to do, I think now when you ask this question in English, I presume your native tongue is Dutch. There's a lot of people at Boscalis who are not speaking their native language all the time. You can start by just remembering that for them, that's already a hurdle. They might be super funny in their mother tongue and then it because they don't have the word um, capacity in Dutch, they can't be as funny in Dutch. And then all of a sudden we're like, well, they're just a really serious person. So 
try and be really conscious of that. And when you notice it, help that person. You can do it now, Joel, where you are in your career, and you can continue to do it throughout your career. And I really believe that hiring, even where we have the capacity to work with somebody, like I said to you earlier, like, first of all, what kind of CEO would I be if I now got angry at somebody in Ukraine missing a deadline? That would be ridiculous. Um, but hire outside of your, you know, bring people on outside where you can. Maybe it's an intern. Maybe it's a any any anything helps. Um, and those are really small small changes that you can do that will have a ripple effect. And finally, if anybody here is in marketing, tell them what you're doing, Joel. And at the end of the year, make this into a story for the newsletter um, in December 2023 and say, my name is Joel. This is what I did this year. And here are the three ways I did it. And you can too. I hope that helps answer your question. Awesome. All right. You're like, man, I already have so much stuff to do. I got, yeah. But anyway, you're welcome. <laughs> Uh, you also also some uh, online questions. Oh, absolutely. Um, the whole bunch, but I'll just uh, ask one of them. It's from Alvar. The question is, what are the ingredients to create a safe, welcoming, interesting, encouraging conversation experience? So just give like a five five word answer then. <laughs> oh, you want um, me to repeat the question? Or not? I'm more curious as to where at Al Al Alvar. Alvar, where's Alvar based? I'm not sure. Online somewhere. <laughs> oh, he's in the Netherlands. He's from Spain. Buenos dias. Where where are they? <laughs> where's the camera? I'm so sorry. I cannot see you. Um, okay, we heard welcoming, encouraging. Conversation experience. Conversation experience. Oh, I wish you were in the room today, Alvar, but thank you so much for your, um, Alvar, but Alvar. thank you so much for your question. <laughs> um, that's kind of tough because also we're trying to break, and I'm going to look at the audience here today, even though I wish I could make eye contact with you, but um, we are obviously operating in a super weird blended world, which is like totally random. It's connecting with cells human when we're in the room and then it's like some weird cellular thing that's happening online and it's very disconnected and nobody wants to say that out loud but i just did so i really appreciate that you are making this effort to bridge that gap i would strongly suggest picking up the phone when and where you can i know people say that they don't like to be called you can leave an audio note voice really matters we think that eyes are the window to the soul when actually the voice has a huge plays a huge role in that um, being encouraging, I I just always think that sharing, not in a way that people feel that they need to respond, because there's so much stuff already to respond to, but if there's something fun or kind, or I know I used to live in Madrid in Spain, we lived in Madrid for two and a half years, and I know that in at least in Spanish culture when I was living there, there was a lot of warmth and it was a big part of the culture and it was it was important and we kind of missed that in some of the more Dutch culture vibes. So maybe you can bring some of that culture in, um, just like International Day at a kid's school. Maybe you can bring some of your own culture in. I, I must give you a disclaimer, Alvar, that I'm struggling to answer your question a little bit because one, it's quite broad. Uh, and two, um, I don't have that much context about what you're asking. So I would like to say that if you want to, all oh, this stuff that we still need to talk about sometime, um, imagine. This is also for Joel and maybe for Hans Peter. Um, I always find these three questions are really good. Like ask your team what they wish you knew about their life, about what they're going through. Check in, how open are you today to receiving? Um, and what are you living today that someone else is not? For example, if you had uh, water this morning or if you didn't have children this morning or um, if you don't have a sick parent to take care of. So these are all things that you can ask yourself. This is this is a longer story. We have four minutes. But when I talk about the outsider, when you know, that's why I was saying that non-dominant versus dominant group thing. In the Netherlands, everybody assumes, you know, like my name is Jols and Ben Nederlands and all this stuff. I totally do not feel at home in this country whatsoever. But this was in Abu Dhabi when I was um, consulting to Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi and my tech team had invited me to come play cricket with them. And it was like no big deal. 
So you always have to rethink who the outsider is and when you when you may or may not be that person. Anyway, long story short, this is for Alvar. You can see my email there at the bottom. Alvar, please drop me a line so I can maybe have a 10 minute chat with you to dive a bit deeper. I'd be more than happy to do that. So just let me know what your schedule's like. Oh, please. Hi, I'm hey. Cristina. And I'm a woman in a foreign country. And I also make mistakes. I don't need to be the dominant man to make mistakes in diversity and inclusion. But I really look at uh, what I do and I try to improve every day. But I also see mistakes are making to me, especially when you are the only woman on in the department, for example. And there are small things that I feel is not um, big things, although also big things happen. But I want to do something, but I don't want to make a drama of it especially when it happens with superiors. So what can I do? Oh, thank you so much for your question, Christina. I appreciate that. And how long have you been in the Netherlands? Uh, now almost six years. OK, great. And before? Before I'm from Spain. Yeah. You're from Spain. So from Spain to the Netherlands? Indeed. OK, cool. So I hear you saying a few things. And first of all, thank you for sharing. And thank you for um, also bridging that gap. I really appreciate that. Um, I hear you say that, yes, you do sometimes make mistakes um, and you don't want to make a drama of it. So you don't want to make a drama of which part? So I make mistakes and I try to improve every day. So I don't need to be the dominant man to be to make mistakes. Sure. I also do it. But people also make mistakes with me, especially when I'm the only woman on one department. And uh, for example, the, there are some daily things that I see they don't do with my male colleagues. And I don't want to make a drama of it, especially with my superior, but I want that this, I want to, to, to say it or to change it. So what was the advice there? Man. I, was, I should have just stopped at 11.27. Thank you so much for your question. That is such a hard question. And I don't think you're just speaking for yourself when you say that. I think you're speaking the voice of a lot of people. Um, and that's not necessarily tied to gender, but in your case, I can appreciate what you're saying. And I do wanna honor what you've said today, which is they're not making those same things. They're not doing the same things to my male colleagues. May I jump to the assumption or conclusion that you're talking a little bit about microaggressions? Micro or not micro? Uh -huh, micro or macro, good times. Um, so that's a really, that's a really difficult question, but it really is the reality and it really is the truth of why I'm standing here today. And um, I understand that you don't want to make a drama of it because I'm going to talk about energy right now. And again, some of you may or may not be willing to receive this. I respect that. But it can be very hard to this, this drama energy, thank you to Freud, is very much associated with the feminine. So if you're trying to be included in the team, it's going to be increasingly hard to say something that makes you an outsider. If you are now saying, hey, this is happening, you are by default an outsider and that's brutal because if you become an outsider you're done because then everybody doesn't feel comfortable around you they're gonna not invite you to the beer just whatever on friday which is like super awkward um so you're you're like up against this whole whole system which hans peter also mentioned so that's a word i don't know because the the main thing would be you just say it that you have felt uh, that way. But if you say it, then you create the drama thing, right? Oh, I'm so sorry. Felt or failed? So so if, if something happens and I feel uh, bad, let's say, then you will recommend me to just mention it, to, to, to say it to the person, like you made me feel bad this way because you said this. But if I do that, then it's the drama thing. So I cannot give feedback. So what can I do instead? Um, well, first of all, I think you and Joel should probably start a new team together because it sounds like that would be cool. But also, um, no, in all seriousness, I think many people have gone through this situation and I will speak with my experience and that was to write down things without emotion as much as I could, which is kind of crazy because I'm a rather 
emotional feeling person like we all are. We are um, we embody emotion, but start by writing it down. Just say factually, this is what happened. This is this is th this is what I'm experiencing in this moment. Every time you do that, take 24 hours. I'm giving you really like corporate advice, which is like totally not my thing. But here we go. Write it down, give it some time and re reflect back to yourself. This idea that you have that you can't make a drama out of anything, that's bullshit. I'm really sorry, but those people on your team, they need to be in this room today or somebody needs to bring me back uh, next week, Friday to sit with those guys because I want to help them understand the impact that they're having that they might not know. They might not be aware. I want to go from the base point that they don't know, that they're not aware. You have a right to however it is that you're experiencing something as they do. Both sides have a right. But I can tell you that if this gap goes on, you are going to leave the team or someone else is going to leave the team. But definitely your great ideas are not going to happen because it's not safe. So the idea that you're not feeling like you can talk about something, a micro or a macro aggression, that's a big deal. Um, I'd, like I said, sometimes writing really helps so you can start to reflect back dates, times, patterns and the implication of you doing your job well. And I really believe that in 2023, we can be having that conversation. You not inviting me to beers on a Friday night because I'm the only woman on this team has this and this and this impact. You're leaving me off this and this and this and this project brief. I am good at this and this and this, and you are refusing to accept my skills. Get clear. Now, remember that when you're talking from an emotional energy, it can be hard to meet logical energy. So that's why I'm suggesting, unfortunately, because I have Mass, massive respect for emotional energy, but that's why I'm suggesting to get into that logical space so that you are going to make it easier. You're the mouse right now. You're going to make it easier for them to understand. And but when, remember when I said earlier that sometimes when you're in the non-dominant group, you have to do so much more work. That's exactly what Christina, right? That's exactly what Christina is about to do. So on top of her day job, I want you to be aware of what she's about to have. She what she has to do just to do her job. And I'm sorry, but that's not OK. So and again, I know you're speaking for a lot of people and I'm not trying to make this. I, I, I'm not trying to make this to your case specific. I very much recognize that you're going to have to do some of that harder work, and sometimes it really helps to find one or two people on your team that it's going to be the easiest with to do this. There's got to be one of the, the those. Team members of yours that are going to be better at receiving what you need to share. And unfortunately, it might also mean that you have to step out of who you are right now and turn up as a leader. Think of yourself as the Joan of Arc of this team and help them level up. I wish I didn't have to ask you to do that, but just like I asked Joel to do a couple of things in 2023, maybe, maybe you will have to as well. That all being said, we're over time, but also that all being said, I don't know the severity of the micro or macro aggressions, um, but I can tell you that a microaggression can be something like a thing about a name which somebody you know doesn't honor, um, or it can be something like the accent example I gave you, but it can be much bigger and microaggressions often progress to macro. If you paid attention when Trump was president, you would have seen this happening. So. I really honor the spectrum of the experience that you're going through. And um, I know that I can't give you full blown feedback or advice in this forum, but I think for everybody, it's very brave to all the people that ask questions today, very courageous. Um, and I know that you're not alone. So I hope that today inspires joint action um, and a joint commitment of all of you to do number two on the list, sort yourselves out, work together to enable more people to do their job to the best of their ability. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. That was very Thank inspirational. Uh, my commitment is that I'm not going to unlearn what I just learned <laughs> and uh, I've learned a lot. So thanks for uh, for your presentation. Thanks for everybody watching uh, here in the auditorium and online. And uh, you've got your sort of information, so uh, you can take a picture and then uh, have a follow-up session. So, all right. Thank you very much. Thank you.